when time travel was first developed, it wasn't long before people realized that laws had to be made. All the species who had the technology agreed that it would only be used for research. It is intriguing to research and create an in-depth analysis of time travel and the various problems it causes in the Star Trek universe. Understandably, a human-centric perspective is all we're ever going to get. Looking at this from an Eagle Eye's point of view, it all begins with the United Earth's Starfleet being little more than puppets. It moves on to the 23rd Century Federation Starfleet being a temporal power that used time travel casually, to the 24th Century Starfleet more forgetting about it, or barely knowing of it, to the 29th Century finally beginning to patrol time and keep a watchful eye, to the 30th Century Starfleet actively having accords and working as a police force to prevent all-out war, to a shattered and defeated 31st Century Starfleet destroying all its time travel equipment and keeping to laws they could never enforce at this point, even if they wanted to. Let's just get into it. Where's, Where's Clang? Clang? The, the humans, humans have him. him. They cover the evidence. I will. I, will. I, I promise you. you. The first time humanity ever actively becomes involved in things dealing with time travel is during the 22nd century Temporal Cold War. As stated before, at this time, Starfleet would be little more than a pawn or puppet of the various factions that were attempting to gain dominance as they fight each other. The United Earth would never directly be able to impact nor control any part of the Temporal Cold War. While we don't have a full scope of the temporal powers that were involved, we do know of several that existed. This includes Future Guy, a man who would claim to be a part of the 28th century and use the Sulaban of the 22nd century to enact his will, the Nakul, a 29th century terrorist government that ultimately forces the Temporal Cold War into an all-out war, a race from another dimension known as the Sphere Builders, and the United Federation of Planets, Starfleet. The Temporal Cold War that I've been mentioning is defined by several proxy conflicts and internal struggles that would culminate in the 22nd century, specifically the years of 2151 to roughly 2161. It would also include the 20th century, specifically the years of 1939 to 1945. We're just going to get back to that in a bit. The main two proxy powers that would be consistently used by the various temporal powers included the Sulaban Cabal and the United Earth. The United Earth would actually be forced into several conflicts due to the actions of the Sulaban Cabal. The United Earth wasn't alone, though. The Cabal would find itself with a myriad of enemies. This included the Sulaban Renegades, a faction that realized the damage the Cabal was causing and broke off in an attempt to fight them, as well as the Tandarians, a government that was in open war with the Cabal after realizing that the Sulaban had temporal abilities. While there is no evidence of any temporal powers assisting, the Tholian Assembly would make an appearance in the Cold War, trying to acquire a timeship. Though if they knew what the timeship could do, or just trying to get the vessel because they knew it was advanced, is still somewhat in the air. United Earth would be plunged into the conflict when the Sulaban Cabal attempted to destabilize the Klingon Empire. Had they been successful, this would have resulted in a Klingon civil war. Luckily, these efforts would fail, and the United Earth dispatched a ship to the Empire to deliver a Klingon warrior that had been wounded who was trying to escape the Cabal. Thanks to the United Earth's Starfleet keeping him alive, the Empire would identify the attempts to destabilize their government, and the Civil War would be averted. I work for a different kind of organization. We make sure that people like Silic don't interfere with historical events. I've never heard of a group like that. That's because it doesn't exist yet. Ultimately, a person known as Time Agent Daniels would reach out to the United Earth's Starfleet officer, Captain Archer. He would do this in an attempt to persuade the man to help him capture Selig, leader of the Sulaban Cabal. Curiously, this happened immediately after Selig saved the NX-01 Enterprise, so Archer would understandably be confused, though he would try to help ultimately. While it's never completely verified, Time Agent Daniels was likely a part of Starfleet and the United Federation of Planets. Both the 30th Century Starfleet Temporal Powers and Future Guy are two subjects that I definitely need to delve into more and I will at a later time. But suffice it to say, the Temporal Cold War is a lot more gray when you look at who's the good guy and who isn't, even if the dialogue tries to tell us differently. With Klingon Empire stability no longer an issue, minor events between the United Earth and the Sulaban Cabal would still occur. The two constantly in a move-counter-move relationship. The Cabal would often try to stop the NX-01 Enterprise's voyage 
outright destroy the vessel, and conversely, sometimes outright assist them. Again, this is something that needs to be discussed more in depth, but it would appear that the Cabal and the United Earth might have been more aligned than either side realized, even if they both seem to be at each other's throats. The next major event would be of a move by a temporal power known as the Sphere Builders. As stated, it's an organization from another dimension. They would convince the Zindi to attack Earth and begin the United Earth Zindi War, or Zindi War for short. This all starts when the United Earth is devastated by a Zindi test weapon. Future Guy would tell the United Earth's Federation about the Zindi and that they were continuing to create a massive weapon in order to finish the job. The United Earth would then dispatch the NX-01 Enterprise to find the weapon and destroy it. The government would be joined by the Andorian Empire and, while it's never directly stated, likely the Vulcan High Command against the Zindi. I do include the Vulcans because we see them at the end of the Temporal Cold War, sending ships to welcome back the NX-01 Enterprise. This meant that their vessels were present and available, or at least trying to get there, when the Zindi weapon attacked. Oh yeah, spoilers. They also were allies of the United Earth, which was a big deal. Speaking of the Zindi War, thanks to mostly the NX-01 Enterprise, but ultimately a joint effort between the United Earth and Andorian Empire, along with a majority of the Zindi Council that would realize their mistake, the weapon is destroyed before it can get to Earth. Terra was finally safe from all-out annihilation. The last major front would be... News on Parade! America and Germany together! fight for freedom. In his first visit to the home of the brave, the German Chancellor received a warm welcome from the Big Apple. He greeted enthusiastic crowds in Times Square and took in the view from the top of the Empire State Building. Watch that first step. Later, the Fuhrer paid a call to Lady Liberty, where he was given the keys to the city. The whirlwind tour was capped off by a four-hour speech to city leaders where the Fuhrer outlined his vision for a prosperous alliance between Germany and America. Okay, okay, let's reset a second. Up to this point, the 22nd century had been the beachhead for the multiple temporal powers trying to vie for dominance. The majority of the proxy conflicts would be in this specific century. However, in a last-ditch effort to win the war, Vosk, leader of the Nakul, which were basically a race of terrorists, launched an all-out attack on the United Federation of Planets in the future, the 30th century. He would defeat Starfleet, and then he would escape to 1939, where he would then ally with the Nazis and help the Nazis fight against the Allies, giving them major victories and changing the tide of the war. He would use Nazi Germany so that he could create a temporal portal to escape, but not before Germany invaded the United States. Oh my god, this is bad writing. I am almost completely sure this was an F you from the writers. The, the writers who started this actually wrote it after they heard they had been fired. Anyway. Desperate to stop him at all costs, the 30th century Starfleet, or at least Temporal Agent Daniels, would pull the NX-01 out of time and order them to fight against the Nazis and Nakul as his last dying breath. Captain Archer, along with his new ally, Selic of the Sulaban Cabal, would defeat Vosk and time would effectively be reset. While Time Agent Daniel would state this was the ending of the Temporal Cold War, it was more likely that this was just a calming of tensions. The Temporal Cold War would eventually become a temporal war that devastates not just the Prime timeline, but multiple universes. The 22nd century was not only a beachhead, but the beginning of time travel for the denizens of the United Earth and the Federation Starfleet. It would only be a short amount of time before we see Starfleet become a temporal power in the 23rd century. Since the formula worked, we can go back in time to any planet, any era. In the 22nd century, Starfleet would effectively be a pawn of more powerful entities during the quote-unquote Temporal Cold War. However, while time travel wouldn't become commonplace in the early 23rd century, it wouldn't be rare either. Honestly, the 23rd century is probably one of the most confusing eras for time displacement. At the beginning of the century, Federation member worlds were aware of time travel and that it was feasible. However, none had found a way of stabilizing what would become deemed as quote-unquote time crystals, the only known way of traversing time for that era. 
This was largely due to the decay rate of the mineral that would mean that using it would be inconsistent. That said, even though the Federation couldn't figure it out, there would be other species that perfected the technology, including that of a device that was a handheld version, allowing persons to travel 30 minutes back in time to correct any mistakes. The real utilization of time travel would be perfected during the Federation Klingon War of 2256 to 2257. Section 31, a semi-secret organization at the time, would be able to embed the minerals into a quote-unquote time suit, which would become known as the Red Angel. This was a part of the Daedalus Project, which was ultimately something used by the Federation in their temporal arms race against the Klingons. It was meant to win the Klingon Federation War faster. The Red Angel suit would work, but be unstable. Michael Burnham, an officer at the time, would utilize the suit to stop a conflict with a nefarious AI known as Control by traveling into the 31st century and then destroying the suit. Though traveling through time like this would mean that the time crystal was spent and it couldn't be used regardless. These affairs would be classified and lost the annals of time ultimately, with most of Starfleet not having known of any of the events. Even though time travel by Starfleet would originally be in the shadows, ultimately it would become commonplace in the mid to late 23rd century. The crew of Starfleet ships wouldn't be surprised if they traveled back in time. They wouldn't question how it happened, they just wanted to get back to the era they were supposed to be in. Traveling through time was something that they knew was a risk. In the early years of the USS Enterprise's five-year mission, the crew would discover a way of intermixing the matter-antimatter within the Enterprise's reactor in order for them to travel wherever they wanted to go throughout time. This wouldn't be the only way that Starfleet could travel through time, though. They would also discover the Guardian of Forever, an entity that would allow them to go wherever they wanted to go and even change time itself. These two separate events would effectively make the 23rd century Starfleet a temporal power. Unfortunately, it would appear that a 23rd century Starfleet having the ability to time travel is tantamount to giving a child of under two years a gun that can kill billions. Starfleet would not treat time travel in any form of respect, no temporal directives being created, no restrictions or requirements that appear to be put upon those who use it, and no known attempts to safeguard the knowledge. Arguably, the way Section 31 and the USS Discovery handled the time crystals, the way they tried to protect the information, is better than the way Captain Kirk and his Starfleet did. This technique would be used quite a few times, including simply to watch the Earth for historical review, as well as utilized by Kirk in order to go back and find wells to save Earth. Ironically, this complete disregard for the technology and the knowledge and ensuring that none of it falls into the wrong hands would likely mean that the Federation of the 24th century would have no idea what to do with what they had. The 24th century Starfleet would enter into their Golden Age, which ironically would cause a sort of temporal age atrophy. It's ironic that Starfleet would be at its most powerful in a long time here and not utilize one of its greatest advantages. See in the 24th century. I look forward to it. Or should I say backward? Don't get started. As discussed in the episode before this one, you can find it in the top right hand corner or in the description. After inventing time travel in the 23rd century and being able to simply adjust the engine mixture of a Constitution class vessel, then being able to go wherever you wanted, Starfleet in the 24th century apparently just chose not to do this. There's no exact reasoning why the Federation just stopped utilizing time travel after having discovered it. However, a likely scenario is that Starfleet classified the information and forbid its usage. This would cause the information and knowledge to ultimately be lost to the annals of time, kind of like a spore drive. Now, whether there was a complete ban on it or it was still used in the background by organizations such as Section 31 remains somewhat of a mystery. However, given how events will ultimately pan out, it's likely that the usage of time travel was highly restricted. We know this by what characters say, or more importantly, what they don't. It can be observed in The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. One of the most prominent examples would be in TNG, in fact, specifically the episodes Time's Arrow Part 1 and Time's Arrow Part 2. For those who need a brief recap, we have a Starfleet officer stuck in the past with the possibility of death going to occur. 
Here, the usage of time travel technology would have been vital to ensure the safety of both the timeline and the officers involved. However, due to the dialogue and what we observe, it appears that this likely isn't an option available to them. Hell, I'd say they didn't even know it was a possibility. In fact, entire departments were created to ensure that time travel didn't occur, and if it did, it was minimized on what happened. To be fair, it could be argued that time travel technology was prohibited so that events like what we see in Time's Arrow would occur. That there was a paradox of them having to go back in time, possibly being killed to preserve the timeline. It always happened like that, and they had to ensure that it did. Whether this was something that the future Federation traveled back in time to tell the Federation of the past to do so that everything would work out, or it's just happenstance, we don't know. Though Starfleet's Time Bureau will be something I break down in the next episode. Where I come from, every historian knows the bridge of old 1701D. Where exactly do you come from? My Earth. The late 26th century Earth, to be exact. It is, I guess, ironic that the explosion of Federation culture and the expansion of Starfleet throughout the stars would occur simultaneously with temporal apathy. Even more curious, as time travel would become commonplace around the 26th century. At least, that's what it looks like. It would be from this era that a time travel pod arrives to the Enterprise-D. The pilot of the pod would ultimately be found to be a criminal who either killed or incapacitated the actual owner and used it to travel throughout time and space. The criminal would ultimately be caught and the pod's auto return function would return the vessel to the 22nd century where it had come from, doing untold amount of damage to that era. Which this honestly doesn't seem to bother the crew of the Enterprise-D, so... It's not going to bother us either. The existence of the pod does present a bit of a problem in continuity that does need to be addressed. From everything we know in the TNG episode, this was a matter of time for those who want to go back and watch it, the pod appears to be from the Federation. Oh, well, this is a time pod, and it is from the 26th century. At least, that's what the poor fellow said. You see, he decided to travel back to the 22nd century. That's my time. And he had the misfortune of meeting me. His clothes fit quite well, don't you think? It took me weeks to figure out how to work this thing. The criminal, Rasmussen, would meet the original historian who owned the pod, ultimately overtake him, put on the man or woman's clothes, figures out how to use the ship, and travels through the cosmos. Again, the ship originally came from the 26th century, went to the 22nd century, and ultimately ended up in the 24th century. All of this only really fits neatly if the original traveler, again the real historian that was killed or left behind, was actually a human, and the tech comes from the Federation. It's possible that this is not the case, but it is more logical that the inventor would have figured out how to use the time travel pod if there was some connection to him, even if it was centuries away from when he existed. But the real reason all of this is a problem is because of someone we've already talked about before, Future Guy. From what Daniels tells us, he is from the 28th century. This pod, this 26th century pod doesn't make much sense because future guy in the 28th century would hopefully be able to get one so that he could go and travel and meet the Zindi. He would not be limited to a formless avatar as we see. Again, Daniels even points out the limitations of the technology of his time, which means that Daniels is either lying or isn't expanding on why it's limited. And this isn't just a one-off. In the 27th century, a scientist by the name of Cal Dano sends the Tox Uthot, a weapon of mass destruction, back in time to the 22nd century to safeguard it. Also, what the hell is it with time travelers in the 22nd century, but anyway. It does point us back to the question. This isn't just a one-off. Why would Future Guy use relatively inferior technology to what was available in his century? Well, one answer, and this one was given to me by Lore Runner, which I really like, is that it's possible the 28th century is another dark period or dystopian era for time travel. With the issues that we see with Rasmussen, as well as the talks who thought, the Federation might have began to restrict time travel technology heavily. This would mean that it would be highly, highly unlikely that anyone could get their hands on real technology that they could use, and those within the 28th century would only have rudimentary options. 
Another option, one that I really like, is that future guy is someone else and hiding his abilities on purpose, like what I said may be the case with the guy in the glasses. I still personally hold to that one, by the way. Regardless, we wouldn't see much from the 26th and 27th centuries. Uh, again, something holding them back, possibly the Federation, as I've discussed. In the 28th century, Starfleet begins to actively protect time. Whether they are the only force or one that works in conjunction with other powers, we don't know. What we do know is that vessels like the time ship Aeon and the USS Relativity would be constructed and correct errors in the time-space continuum. Though with these timekeepers, it's interesting how they only make changes that positively impact the Federation, at least in the episodes that we see. This does lead to a theory that I've discussed in the past, but I'm doing another video on it in the near future about how they're possibly not as noble as we think. The 28th century to the 31st century marks the proliferation of time travel technology. During the same time that the Temporal War was raging, the general populace knows about and even utilizes tools for exploring the past. As an example, even high school students in the 31st century dealt with quantum discriminators in their desks. These devices would determine exactly when a message in time was to be sent and was considered a rudimentary tool for teaching. It was so harmless, though, it was given to children. However, the Age of Enlightenment with time travel came to a crashing halt in the 32nd century when all time travel was outlawed and all of the technology destroyed. How this was guaranteed is still a mystery, if it was guaranteed at all. Like with the Golden Age and Federation in the 24th century, the era for enlightenment for the temporal powers was also a gilded time with much more happening in the background. Wait a minute, let me get this straight. I'm going back in time to stop Braxton but you already have him. And there's a third one in our brig. I arrested him earlier today. But don't worry. They'll all be reintegrated in time for the trial. James T. Kirk, the one and only. 17 separate temporal violations, the biggest file on record. The man was a menace. In the past episodes, those of which you can view in the top right hand corner or the link below, I've broken down the various use of time travel, the impacts it's had on Starfleet, and how the Federation has ultimately utilized such methods since the early 23rd century. We've also discussed the various wars, cold or otherwise, that such capabilities bring along with its advantages. However, one thing that I've waited till now to consider to really get into is some of the ancillary groups that would have utilized this technology. I'm Dahmer. Luxley, Department of Temporal Investigations. We've been expecting you. I guess you boys from Temporal Investigations are always on time. Where's Captain Sisko? As we've discussed, the use of time travel for Starfleet would apparently atrophy into the 24th century. It wouldn't necessarily be unknown, possibly even a rung above rare, but the actual traveling through time wouldn't be something included in normal Federation and Starfleet operations. Whether we're looking at the next generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Picard, or even early Discovery, there doesn't appear to be any standard operating procedure to go back in time to adjust or fix things. Indeed, all orders appear to be reactive, not proactive in this circumstance. There were, however, departments that specifically did deal with issues when these events occurred. This would include the Department of Temporal Investigations. Are you sure you don't want anything? Just the truth, Captain. You'll get it. Where do you want to start? The beginning. If there is such a thing. A fun fact about the department is that it was either a part of or incorporated into Division 14 at some time. At least that was the rumor. Division 14 being a specialized Starfleet organization that worked with severe science and or medical related accidents. Temporal Investigations, like its name infers, researches known time travel incidents to ensure that no known contamination of the timelines occur. And when affairs of this sort would occur, they would ensure that officers acted appropriately and if anything needed to be done that had resulted in the time change, 
Proper measures would be taken, though I'm not sure what they intended to do beyond just recording it. Whether the Time Bureau was an effective branch or just useless bureaucracy is not really known. And they don't really seem to be that good at their job, as we do have an episode where they missed the re-emergence of Tribbles, which is a big ecological deal. But anyway. The Time Bureau aside, there is one department that would be extremely competent at the utilization of time travel. We search out and identify potential dangers to the Federation. And once identified, we deal with them. How? Quietly. That is the one and only Section 31. Now I will admit, some of what I'm about to talk about is going to be a postulation, a theory. But it does make everything fit very, very nicely. We do know that at some point, the discovery of Borg technology would occur by the United Earth's Starfleet. Such technology and its existence would disappear overnight for unknown reasons. This of course happening after a few Borg escaped. I've theorized that this is probably due to Section 31 co-opting the project and all of the technology to be had. Borg tech would give Section 31 a massive head start on almost everything. It would ensure that they stayed one step ahead of everyone. It would also explain the amazing ability of the United Federation of Planets' capability to advance its own technology so quickly. The Federation was so advanced that literally the Dominion would say that they could turn rocks into replicators. Now harnessing the energy for time crystal test 9 beta. Charge is at 70% and rising. With any luck, we should be able to make our first jump very soon. Additionally, we do know that Section 31 had been working on time travel. We see this during the Klingon Federation War of 2256 to 2257. They engaged in subversive actions that would become to known as the Klingon Federation Temporal Cold War. This was of course both the Klingons and the Federation trying to figure out how to time travel in order to defeat the other. We know that Section 31 was largely successful here, but all of their gains would either be stunted or lost when the organization was overthrown by a rogue AI known as Control. After the AI's defeat, Section 31 would be reorganized, and that's when people would basically forget about it. But here's a question. What if they continued their research and continued traveling throughout time? Consider yourself lucky to have skipped the temporal wars. Amongst the many horrible things we discovered when weaponizing time, temporal travel can make you pretty sick. Turns out our molecules are designed to function in the time in which they're created. However, unlike before, the organization would use it very carefully, very methodically. And ultimately, they would begin to slow drip the technology, like they did with other technologies, when they felt it was appropriate to allow Starfleet and the Federation to advance. Again, this would explain how they are so far ahead of our heroes, how they can infiltrate everywhere and everything. There's also explanations and justifications why Section 31 would let certain things occur. For instance, I don't have to have time travel capabilities to know someone's going to comment asking why didn't they stop the Dominion War. However, things generally are not black and white. They have to be nuanced. Time travel and the ability to alter time could be like what we saw with the United Kingdom and the Enigma Code. For those who don't know, Alan Turing would crack the Enigma Code in World War II, which meant a lot of German intelligence could be read and understood. However, this information, this intelligence, wasn't always used. They didn't always win every battle that they could have based on what they were reading. They didn't take advantage of everything. This was because if the Germans realized that the code had been broken, they would change it. It meant that sometimes the Allies would send people to their deaths or let them die when they technically could have stopped it. But doing that meant that they would ultimately win the war. So it's quite possible this is what we see with Section 31, letting things like the Dominion War occur, and only making small adjustments when they had to. This was to ensure that time wouldn't be negatively altered, and 
others might not realize what was happening. Though, no matter what they do, eventually they would come upon someone who would figure it out or other powers that had been using it before them. Again, this might be when Section 31 decided to start sharing it with Starfleet counterparts. It would become open and commonplace like we saw in the 30th and 31st century. Now, as I've theorized, I do wonder if the temporal power that was the Federation wasn't just an in-your-face Section 31, that anything to do with time travel really was an S-31 agent. Until we get more information, it's going to be hard to make that determination, though. It also does beg the question. Use of time travel is banned, and it's said that that's ironclad. I wonder if Section 31 actually heeds those laws. Just a thought. At the end of the day, I think there is a strong argument that Section 31 were basically the Lords of Time. But these are just my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know in the comments below.